to the next item of business, which is a statement by the Cabinet Secretary, Shuna Robinson, on response to exceptional winter pressures. The Minister will take questions at the, at the end of her statement. If members wish to ask a question, I would encourage them to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Shuna Robinson. Presiding officer, the staff of the NHS are the beating heart of the service. They have been nothing short of exemplary in the care that they've provided in the face of exceptional winter pressures. They have gone more than the extra mile. They have worked across and beyond boundaries. And above all, they have continued to deliver safe and effective patient care in the most challenging of circumstances. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I give a heartfelt thank you to our NHS, community health and social care staff for their continuing dedication. That thanks is shared by patients and their families, many of whom have contacted me to praise the efforts of staff. Equally, I want to apologise to patients whose treatment has been delayed. I want to take this opportunity to thank them and their families for their patience and understanding during this extremely busy time. Each year we try and prepare for the additional pressure winter can bring. This includes working with the service and other partners since the summer to prioritise and invest an extra £22.4 million to meet a and &E in winter pressures. However, our NHS is facing a number of sustained challenges this winter. Emergency departments seeing the highest level of attendances over the festive period in a number of years. During the two-week festive period, attendances were up 10% compared to the same time the previous year. And in the week leading up to Christmas alone, this level rose to 20%. We saw a huge surge in falls and fractures before Christmas, which has undoubtedly impacted on the number of admissions and length of stay in hospitals. Some hospitals reported the level of demand in one day being the equivalent to average demand for a week. Flu rates in Scotland doubled in December, with the most recent figures from Health Protection Scotland showing around 46 Scots in every 100,000 were suffering from the virus, compared to 22 in every 100,000 for the same week in 2016. Over the festive period, there were over 73,000 calls to the Scottish Ambulance Service between the 15th of December and the 2nd of January. Indeed, overnight on Hogmanay, the ambulance service saw its control centres take almost 40% more calls compared to the same time last year. NHS 24 received more than 45,000 calls in the four days over Christmas, almost double the number of calls of the same period last year, with thousands more calls being taken over the New Year period. Christmas Day in particular was the busiest for NHS 24 since it began in 2002. In short, the demand for emergency care services has been unprecedented over the festive period. Our NHS has sought to manage the impact of this in a number of ways. For example, where necessary for infection control, hospitals have on some occasions closed wards, which means these beds can be closed for a number of days. NHS boards are taking decisions to manage the exceptional demand based on their local plans, which may include some deferral of non-urgent elective surgery. Boards are reporting that over the festive period, the level of cancellations were consistent with that of previous years. It's important to say that unlike in England, there is no blanket cancellation of non-urgent elective procedures planned. In England, it was reported that an estimated 55,000 non-urgent operations could be deferred as a result of their deferral of non, all non-urgent inpatient elective care to the 31st of January. I'd like now to take some time to set out the impact of flu on our health service and on our population and what action has been taken. I've already outlined the increase in flu rates this year, which is at its highest level in the last six years and double that of last year. It is right that we take flu seriously and note that, that Scotland was, was hit by flu earlier than elsewhere in the UK. As we do every year, we put in place preparations ahead of the flu season commencing. We've worked to ensure flu vaccine are available to those who need them and that people are aware and encouraged to be vaccinated. Each year, the World Health Organization reviews evidence from previous years and determines the most likely flu viruses that should be covered by the vaccine programs in the Northern and Southern hemispheres for the next influenza season. These are the only vaccines that are available on the global market. 
The data tells us that the most commonly found flu types in Scotland so far are well matched to this year's vaccine, and it is ill-informed and alarmist to suggest otherwise. Sustained exceptional demands, levels of demand or regular peaks in demand, such as during increased flu levels, requires different clinical processes from the usual systems in place in hospitals. Of course, the vaccine is only useful if we can make sure as many people as possible receive it. And I note the Conservatives claimed over the weekend that uptake rates in Scotland have dropped. The fact is that our uptake rates are broadly in line with the uptake in previous years. Overall, to the, the end of the second week, the second last week of 2017, over 1.4 million people had been vaccinated by the NHS in Scotland. That is 26% of the whole population. To the same point in the previous year, 26% of the population had been vaccinated. So we are in line with where we were last year. And in fact, in some eligible groups, we've increased uptake. For example, pregnant women with risks has in, had increased to 57.5%, which is a higher rate than in England. In Scotland, all primary school children have been offered the vaccine since 2014-15, providing improved immunity to the wider population. This year, 71% of that primary school population has been vaccinated. But in England this year, only children in the first four years of primary school are offered the vaccine. An uptake in that group, by the way, is 50% or less for each of those four-year groups. I want to say a word about healthcare staff vaccination. It is lower than we would want it to be. And I'm absolutely grateful to the NHS staff for all the hard work they do. But in this particular area, I think we can go further. We estimate that so far over 40% of healthcare staff have been vaccinated. That includes both patient-facing and non-patient-facing staff, whereas the English figure only includes frontline healthcare workers. I would caveat this by saying the figure may be an underestimate, as it will not reflect the proportion of staff who may have been vaccinated through the national programme because of clinical eligibility. And we've made clear to the NHS that free seasonal influenza immunisation should be offered by NHS organisations, including primary care employers, to all employees directly involved in delivering care. I know that NHS boards across Scotland have worked hard to promote uptake through innovative approaches and in providing leadership through senior clinicians and managers. We've supported them with national resources, including developing a toolkit that helps those charged with promoting and delivering planning of their local flu campaign and providing campaign posters and leaflets to every health board in Scotland. This year, our public campaign, campaign which launched in October, included adverts for the childhood flu and seasonal flu programmes for adults ran on television, radio, digital and social media platforms. We've also worked with a wide range of partners to distribute promotional materials, including the British Heart Foundation, British Red Cross and Scottish businesses that are Healthy Working Lives registered. In total, this resulted in 106 organisations supporting the seasonal flu campaign and 93 organisations supporting the childhood flu campaign. Campaign materials for the general public from GP surgeries, nurseries, libraries, community centres and antenatal clinics have also been distributed. While ultimately the decision about whether or not to be vaccinated is down to individuals, I'm sure we would all want to take this opportunity to urge all those eligible to get the flu vaccine as soon as possible if they've not already done so. Finally, there has been some rather alarmist commentary on flu mortality rates which have been reported which needs to be corrected. Four people have passed away in hospital who were admitted with flu-related symptoms. Each one of these deaths is a personal and family tragedy. However, all-cause mortality is not the same thing as flu-related deaths. This data reflects deaths due to any cause, accidents, other diseases, old age, not just about flu. And on this point, timing is important. This three-week period at the end of 2017 reflects a period before we really started to see flu infections presenting in our hospitals. So it's too simplistic to say that this excess is explained by flu. What I can say is that work is underway by public health experts to investigate this urgently so we can use facts rather than speculation. As I've said, there are a number of factors contributing towards the current pressures, which hasn't just been about flu, but clearly it will be a key factor over the coming weeks. 
Usually, winter flu, the winter flu season has an eight to 10 week duration. So it's too early to say what the end season picture will be, but we must view the current and emerging data in the right context. We must also allow space for our health service to continue to treat our sick patients with flu-like illnesses or other conditions and to allow them to recover from what has been and still is a very challenging time. NHS and care staff have worked incredibly hard over the last few weeks and have pulled together to cope with winter pressures and I want to pay tribute to them again. They deserve the collective support of this parliament in their endeavours and I hope that's what they'll get today. Thank you. A number of members wish to ask questions, starting with Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for advanced copy of her ministerial statement? And can I also associate these benches with what she has said today? All of us in this chamber have been able to see over the past few weeks the tremendous work which those who work in our health service have actually provided to our constituents and our families, and we all pay tribute to them and their dedication. Can the Cabinet Secretary answer this question, though? Is she uh, able to confirm the alarming reports that the Scottish Ambulance Service's National Command and Coordination Centre, normally reserved for major incidents such as terrorist incidents and emergencies, has been set up and operating for several weeks now because there's simply not been enough call handlers in local call centres and not enough crews out on the road to cope with current high levels of demands? And can she actually tell Parliament what extra support she will be providing hard-pressed ambulance staff, paramedics and call centre operators. Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, can I uh, thank Miles Briggs for his uh, comments about the, the staff. Um, the, it's really important that the messages we send out are in support of our hard-working staff uh, because you know, they have pulled together in a way that has been absolutely astonishing. So it is upon each and every one of us in the comments that we make to get behind our staff in those efforts. He talks about, the, Miles Briggs talks about the Scottish Ambulance Service. The Scottish Ambulance Service has escalation procedures that kick in uh, when they're under pressure. So if you look at the 40% rise in calls on Hogmanay, what the senior management team then will do is to escalate procedures to make sure that the command and control uh, processes reflect that level of demand and of course we would expect them to do nothing less than that when faced with those demands on the service. Of course we support uh, the Scottish Ambulance Service and all of the other parts of the, the system in responding to that. I on a daily basis get updates of what the service is looking like including the Scottish Ambulance Service and we keep very very close uh, to monitoring that. What I would say is the Scottish Ambulance Service has done a tremendous job uh, in responding to this unprecedented level of demand and I would want to put on record my particular thanks to them. Anas Sarwar. Presenting officer, we all give our heartfelt thanks to all our amazing NHS staff who go above and beyond all year round, but particularly at Christmas. To be clear, any failures in our NHS is despite their fantastic efforts, not because of them. But this is not just a winter issue. They have been left overworked undervalued and under-resourced all year round, and this is now amplified in winter. Yesterday, the First Minister and the Health Secretary issued an apology for winter failures. But every month, cancer patients don't get their treatment on time. Every month, children are denied mental health support. And every month, patients are waiting too long. A new analysis has shown that over 100,000 patients failed to meet the four-hour A&E standard in 2017. So it is not just one apology in winter that is needed from the First Minister and the Health Secretary, but over 100,000 apologies needed all year round. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when the warm words will stop? Because thank you alone is not enough. And when we'll actually see meaningful action in support of our NHS staff and in support of Scotland's patients. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I uh, say to Anna Sarwar that the actions we are taking is making sure that through the draft budget, which I hope he will support, will provide record levels of new investment to the NHS. And I look forward to his support for that budget. 
Uh, can I say to Anna Sarwar that we are also making sure that we provide the support and resources uh, all year round, but in winter, this winter, we provided the biggest level of injection of resources that we have seen in any winter, £22.4 million specifically to help the service cope with winter pressures. And in terms of an apology, all health systems across the UK have issued an apology to patients who have had to wait longer. But do you know something? Patients have been hugely praising of the staff. The public have been very understanding that in the face of winter pressures, an unprecedented level of flu, double the rate of last year, they, they understand the pressures that are upon our system, even if Anna Sarwar does not. And a final word on A&E. Scotland's A&E departments have been the best performing over two and a half years. But this winter, for even our best performing A&E departments, my local A&E department in Nine Wells has never fallen below 95%. Over the last two weeks, it has, because of the pressures of fractures, of flu and unprecedented winter pressures. I think most reasonable people would understand that. John Finney to be followed by Alex Paul Hamilton. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement. I'd also like to thank NHS staff. Cabinet Secretary, you talked about working across and beyond boundaries, and I heard of a situation where there were frequent falls in an area. The local hospital made inquiries with the local authority and discovered that the local authority no longer gritted that area around pensioners' houses, but indeed the NHS pay to grit it. Now, if correct, I would commend that approach and the preventative steps that have been taken, and you allude to in your statement, including fla uh, the few flu inoculations. Cabinet Secretary, do you recognise that benefits to the NHS of additional funding for local authority social care and indeed gritting operations and will you ask the cabinet secretary of finance to direct more money to local authorities for these specific purposes cabinet secretary um, well, first of all, can I say to, to John Finney that uh, one of the, the main issues before the flu uh, epidemic hit uh, uh, Scotland was the level of fracture. So he makes an important point about the impact of those falls on the NHS in that we had a wave of mainly frail elderly people who quite many of whom had to have operations. Um, and I know in Ninewells Hospital there were uh, theatres dedicated only to fixing fractures and those many of those elderly people are still in hospital so usually at Christmas and New Year you see bed availability increase as people leave hospital this year has not seen that because of that wave of fractures in terms of the resources put into social care uh, we have now got about 550 million pounds of resources that have gone through uh, the health budget into social care that will be added to by 66 million in the budget for 2018-19 but you know what's been more important than that is the joined up service and when I visited the Perth Royal Infirmary yesterday I visited the discharge hub and there you had side by side local authority colleagues working with the NHS making sure people were getting home as quickly as possible and in many cases preventing people coming into hospital uh, in the first place that is integration working and working well and we should pay tribute to all the staff involved Alice Cole Hamilton to be followed by Jenny Gilruth Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. I absolutely echo the praise that's been rightly delivered by all sides of this chamber to our hard-working NHS staff. But does the Cabinet Secretary expect Parliament to believe that a bout of icy weather and an uptick in flu cases are genu genuinely all that are to blame for the worst waiting times on record? Or is this not just symptomatic of a health service on its knees where these additional pressures are heaped upon hard-working staff fighting fires in every overstretched shift that they do? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, because these are unprecedented winter pressures, the like we have not seen for years. You cannot have a doubling of the flu rates and not expect that to have a severe impact on our frontline services. So what I would say to Alex Cole Hamilton is that we have put in additional resources of 22.4 million in anticipation of a colder winter. The doubling of flu has exacerbated those issues and it is not just an issue for Scotland. All 
all of our health systems across the UK are facing the same, if not worse, uh, winter pressures. And the one thing I would say to Alex Cole Hamilton is this our A &E de departments, because they were performing at such a high level uh, going into winter, had a resilience that many A &E departments across the rest of the UK did not. And it will be interesting to see when their figures eventually come out what the comparison is with the festive season here in Scotland. I think that will be interesting indeed. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary how attendance at A&E departments during the festive period compares with the last few years. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I, I laid out in my statement, they have been much, much higher than in previous years. 20% uh, higher in a &E in the week leading uh, to Christmas. Uh, we've seen around 3,000 more attendances than usual. And of course, that was off the back, as I said in answer to John Finney, of the trauma cases that the service was still trying to deal with in numbers that they had not seen uh, previously. Plus, we had uh, NHS 24, working at levels again that have been unprecedented and the Scottish Ambulance Service uh, also. Um, but despite all of that, what we have seen is a, a service rallying around, people pulling together. And even the A&E figures uh, that have been published today at 78%, uh, they are you know, by no means um, not challenging, they are too low. But, you know, for the service still to be seeing, treating and discharging eight out of ten patients within A&E in the face of all these pressures, I think is commendable to the staff involved. Each and every one of them deserve our praise. Brian Whittle to be followed by Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the number of hospital beds in Scotland has fallen by over 7% in the last four years, and this has particular impact in winter when beds are full, A&E departments are overflowing, and delayed discharge is preventing people going home. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that more has to be done to improve patient flow throughout the health and social care system, particularly in the busy winter months? Cabinet Secretary. So uh, let me deal with uh, acute beds first of all. Uh, acute bed usage has changed dramatically over the 10 years as far more people come in and have day case surgery. I'm sure Brian Whittle is aware of that. So the way our health service is used has changed dramatically. And he's also sitting beside his health spokesperson who has demanded that we shift the balance of resource away from acute spend into primary care spend. So you can't sit side by side asking me to do two different things. What we need to do with the investment that we are making, and I hope you'll support the budget in 2018-19 to make this investment, is to make sure that our investment in community health services can avoid people going into hospital in the first place and get home more quickly. And there has been a 10% reduction in delayed discharge since last year. Yes, there is more work to be done, but when you consider that now most of the delays are within about five or six areas of Scotland, Yes, there's more work to do, but I would hope Brian Whittle would acknowledge the progress that has been made in tackling delay. Ivan McKee to be followed by David Stewart. Ivan McKee. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that there has been no blanket cancellation of elect elective surgery in Scotland this month? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that is uh, correct. Um, elective cancellation so far is in line with last year over the festive period. And that is quite an astonishing thing, given that in England we are seeing a blanket cancellation of elective procedures for the whole of January to the tune of 55, potentially up to 55,000. Uh, in Scotland, we have not done that. We have seen some limited uh, cancellation of elective procedures. We would expect boards to do that on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis to minimise that because the reason it's important to minimise it is it just causes problems for the service further down the line. So we will expect boards to keep that under review. Uh, I should also point out that the last published figures back in November uh, showed a reduction in cancellations. So we were starting from an improved position. So no blanket cancellations, but boards will look at this on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis to help manage pressures. David Stewart to be followed by Emma Harper. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary join with me in thanking all our hard-pressed and dedicated NHS staff for the work they do, not just at Christmas, but all the year round. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree to review the eligibility criteria for the flu vaccine, 
both in terms of age and vulnerability. And finally, does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that GPs have autonomy to apply clinical judgment to extend the flu vaccine to non-eligible patients if the risk of flu would exacerbate illness? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I thank David Stewart, first of all, uh, for, and I of course would thank the staff, but also for the tone of his question. I think that is a very uh, constructive uh, question. And first of all, the eligibility criteria is guided by the public health experts. So we have seen changes over the years in terms of the groups that have been uh, covered by the eligibility criteria, and that is kept under constant review. Um, in terms of the uh, GPs uh, using their clinical judgment, uh, then you know, clin clinicians always have that, that uh, option, but you would be guided by the, uh, the priority groups because they need to make sure, obviously, the focus of the campaign and of the vaccine supply is focused on those priority groups. Um, but you know, that's certainly something, um, once we are out of the winter pressure period and we reflect, uh, on winter as we do, that we will look at whether there is further work to be done around eligibility criteria guided by what the public health experts tell us. Emma Harper to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you. I think the Cabinet Secretary might have covered this in her statement when she spoke about World Health Organisation's determination of the most likely flu viruses. But could the Cabinet Secretary reiterate how the current strain of vaccine matches with the prevalent strains this year? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, um, the, the vaccine is a, a good match uh, for the strains, the, the current dominant strains that are in circulation. Uh, and that's a very important message because uh, to say otherwise, I think risks undermining the confidence that people have in going to be vaccinated. So it's very important that all of us use the opportunity here and outside to encourage everybody uh, uh, who are in those priority groups to go and get vaccinated. It is never too late and it is a good defence against flu. And we know that particularly if you're someone who is under 65 with an underlying health condition, that the impact of flu can be very severe indeed. So it's very, very important. I think also I would say to Emma, Emma uh, Harper that one of the issues perhaps that uh, we need to address is that... Um, because of the relatively mild winters and low rates of flu that we've seen in previous years, perhaps um, there has people who have forgotten how um, difficult and severe flu can be. I think this winter is a reminder of that. And I suspect that what we'll see over the next few weeks is a rise in that vaccination rate as people realize how important getting the va vaccination is uh, to, to their health. Annie Wells to be followed by Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures today have revealed that over the Christmas period, a &E waiting times reached an all-time low. Between Christmas and New Year, 21.6% of patients across Scotland were forced to wait beyond the target of four hours. And in one health board, this figure was a shocking 42.7% NHS Forth Valley. In that single week, 272 people had to wait longer than 12 hours, as compared with just two in the same period last year. What action will the Scottish Government take to restore confidence in our emergency department? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Annie Wells that the, the week ending the 31st of December, which were the figures that were published today at 78%, uh, is disappointing. But I think understandable that in the light of all of these pressures that we've seen, that the levels of performance in A&E that we've seen over the last two and a half years, the best in the whole of the UK, were unlikely to be able to be maintained in the face of these unprecedented winter pressures. And I think most reasonable people would understand that. Uh, what's important uh, now is that we're focused on helping those A&E departments recover. And the fact that despite all of those pressures still nearly eight out of 10 patients were uh, seen treated and discharged uh, within the four hours. It's actually quite a remarkable thing in the pressure, in the light of all these winter pressures. And I would just gently point out to Annie Wells this, surely uh, the Prime Minister and the Tory Health Secretary wouldn't have had to have apologised if they weren't facing some of the same winter pressures within their A&E departments. So I would have thought coming here and somehow saying that the position in Scotland is somehow 
different from elsewhere in these islands is really disingenuous in the extreme. We're all facing winter pressures and what we should be doing is getting behind our hard-working staff rather than talking down their efforts. Ash Denham to be followed by Monica Lennon. Ash Denham. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what alternative services are open to people who are concerned that they may have flu-like symptoms short of going to A&E? Are there more appropriate services to try first, for instance? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, there are. And uh, can I say that the, one of the best first ports of call would be NHS Inform. I can tell Parliament that uh, NHS Inform, the NHS Inform website on Christmas Day had 60,000 hits which is unprecedented and I think NHS Inform is a hugely important uh, source of information and now has become a key part of the health advice uh, system out there. In addition, obviously there is NHS 24 which many, many, many patients have used. There is your local GP practice, there is the out of hours service, out of hours and of course importantly there is community pharmacy. Now what we would say is that if someone has flu-like symptoms we would not be wanting them wandering about potentially infecting others and the advice is to stay uh, at home but family and friends will be able to get uh, over the counter remedies from a community pharmacy uh, uh, but if any doubt then please contact NHS Inform where you can get good advice and information. Monica Lennon to be followed by Sandra White. Monica Lennon. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that NHS staff in Lanarkshire have been not only doing their day job, but they've also been brought in as volunteers to cover clerical and cleaning roles. They are the heroes that have kept our hospitals in Hare Myers and Wishaw and Monklands running. But staff and patients in my region are wondering why NHS bosses in Lanarkshire have had to go looking for volunteers when other health boards in Scotland haven't. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that a properly resourced health board with a strong workforce plan shouldn't have to resort to this kind of plan? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, I would pay tribute to the staff in NHS Lanarkshire. Um, no one forced them to do that, but they rallied round and came out in huge numbers to support the frontline staff, and I would pay tribute to each and every one of them. Now, we've been looking at um, NHS Lanarkshire had particular challenges, I think partly because they had three A&E departments that were hugely under pressure uh, and flu particularly has hit NHS Lanarkshire um, very, very hard indeed. We have been working particularly with NHS Lanarkshire to support them, to make sure that they are able to keep uh, patients safe and keep services operating. I would also pay tribute to the GPs who have come out and worked that Saturday, this last Saturday morning. Uh, I think that is a real credit to them in doing so and did help to relieve some of the pressure uh, on the hospital services. So it is not something that we see um, and wouldn't expect staff to have to do very often, but I think it says a lot about our staff that when push comes to shove and the service is under pressure, people roll up their sleeves and they get on with the job and they're to be commended for that. And finally, Sandra White. Thank, thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, I think we all welcome the extra 22.4 million to support boards meet, meet a &E and winter pressures. In addition to this in extra investment, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm to, to me anyway that the Scottish Government will continue to work with health boards and be available to assist them with the pressures they are under, not just at this time, but in the future also? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we uh, monitor every day and I get a report every day on what is happening uh, across our system uh, our, and I also should pay tribute to our, our civil servants and senior officials who have been out and about in the service providing really, really important support uh, to the front line um, and to our senior management teams out there. Uh, what we also do, I can say to Sandra White, is once we are through uh, this winter period, um, and it's important that we're all focused on getting through the winter period because flu is going to be around for an, uh, another few weeks and all of the impact that that will bring, so we're not out of the woods yet, uh, is to then, after winter, to do a, re a proper analysis, as we do after every winter. And I can say to Parliament this, if there are lessons to be learned in terms of where we need to make changes, other things we need to do, then, of course, we will do that for next winter. That is part of the uh, normal course of the way we would do uh, winter planning and preparations uh, in advance of the following winter. 
Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and members for their participation? That concludes our statement on winter flu, and we'll now move on to the next item of business. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.